I would like to introduce to you uh, Mrs. Caterina Montagnoli. She is a young midwifery leader from Italy and she works in Switzerland. Caterina is focused on reproductive health among migrants and she balances her clinical work with research and she is a midwifery educator. Caterina, go ahead. Thank you very much, Yuri, for this presentation and welcome everybody to this session. I am very excited and also quite nervous to be here. And uh, well, first of all, happy International Day of the Midwife, everyone. So uh, I'm glad that you tuned in for my presentation. And this presentation actually is the result of my uh, master thesis and um, be, just just before starting let me oh Yuri can you please uh, put me a presenter thank you uh, let's start uh, with thank you up let's start with a little quiz that I created uh, and uh, we will see the results of this uh, little poll at the end of the presentation so uh, just to present you the outline of the whole presentation i will start uh, by talking about uh, uh, life in geneva and switzerland uh, um, why interdisciplinarity is the key um, process to conduct such a research uh, my materials and methods uh, results uh, so with these uh, free uh, three parts uh, what is at stake uh, so uh, all the limitations uh, and um, future studies so just before uh, starting back uh, i will show you again the qr code so that you can uh, um, take the time to take the picture and arrive to the poll <laughs> okay very well okay so, um, what are, what were, and what are my motivation? Why I am so interested in this topic? So, being myself a migrant, because I come from Italy and I live in France and I work in Switzerland, um, I um, felt myself uh, uh, how migration is a, a prescient issue of our time, uh, economic migration, but as well. Um, why not uh, climate change migration and all the different types of migration. We've been talking about migration internationally in the Global Compact on Safe and Orderly Migration, which was approved in Marrakesh in December 2018. But uh, one more time, it failed to include uh, irregular migrants. And uh, as we can see, um, International migration is a, is a phenomenon that continues to grow and very rapidly and just to tell you the very last uh, uh, data of our time, um, in the first trimester of 2021, uh, there has been uh, the biggest uh, uh, number ever of people dying in the Mediterranean Sea, just to let you know that uh, the pandemic doesn't stop actually migration. So, um, why migration in Geneva? So migration, uh, Geneva is a, um, a global magnet uh, for migrants. Uh, they are full of uh, international organization among other um, a set of UN agencies, uh, the International Center for Migration, Health and, Dep and Development, uh, where I did my stage, and uh, many, many other, um, many, many other international organizations. They are CRC. Uh, and many other but um, unfortunately this uh, this magnet is not just represented by the multitude of international money organizations present in the area but uh, as well from the lack of formal network for families because families that move in Geneva um, most of the times don't manage to find a kindergarten for their children um, and other facilities uh, uh, that would allow them uh, to, to just exploit uh, regional uh, services. 
And uh, this is the other reason why Geneva is a global magnet for migrants, because uh, apart from the economic migrants or migrants coming uh, with uh, um, a direct contract with international organization, there are many, many other uh, coming uh, for um, like uh, filling the gap uh, of uh, the lack of a formal network uh, for families, for sustaining families. Um, and this uh, was uh, really very much, um, let's say, um, recognized uh, by the um, state of Geneva. Uh, when in 2016 it launched the Papyrus operation, which was a massive operation to regularize uh, um, irregular migrants which were, who were living in the area uh, for more than 10 years uh, in an irregular situation, but uh, who somehow also uh, met uh, a certain type of criteria. And uh, the University of, Gen of Geneva at the same time launched the Parchment study, where I also um, uh, had the, the opportunity to work in, um, to analyze uh, from an economic and healthcare and social point of view how regularization actually impact on the life of irregular migrants. So I did this uh, internship experience uh, and I also worked as an activist in the past five years. And um, uh, most of the times uh, I was uh, uh, at the Kamsko unit, which is a primary healthcare unit uh, uh, financed uh, uh, by the Cantonal Hospital, and which is uh, a healthcare unit dedicated to people without healthcare insurance. Uh, and uh, as you might uh, well and guess, this Kamsko unit uh, takes care most of the times so of irregular migrants. So, uh, for going next, uh, um, I decided uh, to uh, really re reply to this question of mine uh, with um, an interdisciplinary scoping review to, so to see uh, what are uh, the, the, the results in the literature uh, with regards to social science, anthropology, and healthcare in general. Um, about uh, irregular migrants' access uh, to reproductive health uh, and uh, their uh, clinical, uh, maternal, and reproductive outcomes. So overall, I found uh, 92 studies, uh, which I included in this scoping review, and uh, there are some additional data which I gathered personally during my hospital activity and internship uh, um, um, at, uh, as an activist uh, at the Kamsko unit. Uh, so, uh, to go forward, uh, um, these are the very first results uh, in the sense that I really wanted to start uh, as a healthcare professional from the healthcare point of view. And in the literature, I found that it um, doesn't matter really the assiduity of antenatal care attendance. Um, when it comes to pregnancy outcomes for irregular migrants. So, and this is a, a result of a research done by Hans Wolf and its team and his team in 2008 um, and performed in Geneva. So, um, this this paradox in the literature um, is was very surprising to me uh, because uh, of all the rest of the literature I've been reading so much in these years, uh, which states exactly the opposite. So irregular migrants as people without a legal status uh, actually um, are more prone uh, according to the WHO and to other uh, international organizations, the RCRC and, uh, and so on, um, are more prone to have uh, worse uh, um, healthcare outcomes, medical outcomes, uh, uh, but uh, especially because they are a more vulnerable population. But when it comes uh, to, the, to Geneva, uh, this is uh, not true. This, um, the acidity of access, the access to antenatal care and the regularity to uh, such antenatal care services, uh, it does not impact uh, on, uh, upon pregnancy outcomes. Um, 
And when looking a bit further in the literature, I found that there were some other studies that were uh, prospecting and presenting such data, uh, um, and which took into consideration other variables uh, than the simple access to antenatal care, uh, but as well, uh, for example, in the case of Canada and um, uh, and Kalanu in 2017, uh, the ethnic curves uh, for uh, uh, populations of, uh, of interests. For example, um, Ethiopian uh, people living in Canada, or when it comes to the US, uh, uh, Mexican migrants uh, living in New York. And uh, when it, um, for what concerns the U.S., uh, um, this uh, phenomenon, since it was very much linked uh, with the birth weight uh, um, of the infant, uh, of the newborn, uh, was uh, described as the birth weight paradox. And I asked myself, why is there such a paradox in the literature? Why are why Acidity of uh, access to antenatal care does not correspond to the better outcome, um, better pregnancy outcome. So uh, I responded myself uh, uh, by saying that uh, there is um, an historical uh, process uh, and uh, it is also current uh, uh, in Western country and um, and this historical process uh, has this as this trend uh, has set itself uh, to um, medicalize uh, pregnancy so pregnancy um, is very much uh, assumed uh, for the general public uh, as a condition as a condition which might uh, which should be uh, cared for um, by a specialist, a gynecologist or an obstetricians. In Italy, for example, the first question you would ask, uh, well, not myself, but the first question you would ask uh, to a pregnant mother is, so who's your, who's your gynecologist? And uh, who has taken care of you during this pregnancy? And I responded myself, this is a very uh, cultural model, very much cultural model rooted in our uh, cultural uh, Western, in, in our cu Western culture. And um, this is also one way to justify the, the lack of benefits uh, arising from the uh, assiduous medicalization uh, uh, by antenatal care access for un undocumented migrants. Uh, and um, um, of course, adding to the ethnic specific curves, the healthy migrants effect, uh, and uh, the effect that we are considering pregnancy um, at, at the very basis uh, as a physiological state of being. Um, but uh, let's go a bit further and uh, um, like, uh, put it in 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 prospect with uh, the current uh, the current pandemic we are living in so the paradox uh, um, can also be explained somehow in in this covid period uh, uh, through the fact that um, we uh, had to we were forced to uh, during uh, lockdowns all over the world to uh, re-understand access to reproductive health and uh, maternal health care um, and to uh, reorganize it, uh, restructure it uh, uh, according to the needs of every person. So in the US, uh, it is uh, very, it was at, at, at least very um, easy uh, to have up to 22 visits, uh, in-person visits uh, during uh, pre-COVID pregnancy, uh, while um, in, a, in a very recent study uh, which um, tried to understand uh, the benefits of telemedicine, um, these visits uh, were um, able to be reduced uh, and compacted uh, to um, eight visits uh, in in the whole pregnancy. And uh, if we think about WHO guidelines uh, on access uh, um, uh, to antenatal care services, uh, they also um, rather 
propose uh, a maximum, a minimum of uh, eight antenatal care visits. So uh, we have uh, we have experienced uh, as midwife, as professionals, as students, why not? Uh, how uh, telemedicine can be a good substitute for lowering uh, in present contacts, and how restructuring antenatal care services uh, uh, is important to comply with uh, the clinical distancing need, uh, and um, and somehow how useless how uh, um, little of use were uh, um, like uh, the hyper the over medicalization of uh, of pregnancy proposed uh, in this uh, pre covid area uh, to go next, uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to uh, state these uh, four four points uh, that go a bit uh, out of the out of the topic, uh, and uh, like outline the fact that uh, clinical distancing and referral to primary healthcare centers uh, has been a very um, a primary step uh, to. Um, uh, comply with the with the lockdown and with the general measures uh, due to COVID, uh, that uh, women became uh, real partners of the healthcare providers, especially in case uh, of uh, um, complication during the pregnancy. Let's think about. Uh, um, like diabetes, uh, gestational diabetes, where mother had to well are still taking their glycemia and referring to their general practitioner or medical doctors and how midwives really uh, led this transition to over medicalization to physiology why not also through telemedicine through the mean of telemedicine and this is uh, where I also talk about uh, how much uh, it matters interdisciplinarity. So um, access uh, to reproductive health in general um, is just not a matter of health. It does not uh, include uh, health, only healthcare professionals. As we just uh, stated, it includes, uh, first of all, uh, women that they are their partners. And um, it includes as well a set of determinants of health such as, uh, for example, in the case of telemedicine, uh, all the administrative procedures, uh, and why not uh, all the um, IT procedures, all the IT help uh, to set it up, uh, these uh, telemedicine options. Uh, and um, and this other set of uh, determinants of health uh, include, among others, uh, of course, uh, migration, the state of the person, the knowledge of the language uh, uh, spoken in the country, in the welcoming country, the social and legal status, the cultural variables, uh, personal visions, uh, personal experience, uh, and the economic possibilities. So um, now I, I pass uh, to the social science uh, point of view uh, because uh, we just realized uh, how uh, social determinants of health can be uh, important in accessing uh, health uh, in accessing antenatal care, and uh, I wanted to I wanted to, to understand uh, as a student uh, and uh, also as a scholar uh, where can we locate the pregnant body of irregular migrant uh, socially. So um, I've been uh, looking in the literature, and um, the first uh, the very first obstacle to access uh, antenatal care was the cost the expensiveness of antenatal care in switzerland and it is also a reason why um, irregular migrants often lack uh, uh, healthcare insurance even though it is a compulsory uh, thing for a regular person living in switzerland and then uh, um, um, still looking in the, in the literature, I found um, um, 
the description of uh, of these uh, deservingness and entitlements uh, situations uh, where the biological where well, uh, a person becomes a biological citizen because uh, of uh, their um, their because of it her, his or her needs uh, in this case it's rather her needs um, but uh, in uh, the petrina book in 20 published in 2013 uh, um, the author describes uh, this, uh, this process of deservingness and performing illness uh, to access uh, health but also legal rights in the um, case of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. And um, I, I, I really found uh, um, a sort of um, parallelism uh, between uh, what happened at the time in uh, actually uh, 26 years ago and um, what um is uh, happening now not only in Switzerland but also in the whole of Europe uh, where uh, we only uh, provide rights uh, to the person in need when we realize that they are really in need when they uh, perform what they allow us uh, to understand uh, their bi biological need and their biological citizenship. And there's also actually um, all over Europe uh, a law that uh, entitles people to access uh, free of cost uh, care in general, emergency care. Um, and uh, and this is also the, the 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 reason why I particularly liked uh, this uh, this parallelism between uh, um, between uh, biological uh, citizens and uh, health rights, and then. Um, and other social determinants are the lack of knowledge, the lack of uh, uh, networks. So the fact that uh, a recently uh, arrived people uh, doesn't know where to go, where to look for uh, for care, for free of costs care. Um, and it was uh, the case, uh, uh, of course, in the healthcare center where I worked. And as well, uh, the fact that uh, as a person without a legal status, uh, you don't have uh, any social protection because uh, you're working, uh, uh, as we say in French, au noir. You have a black um, black contract in the sense that you don't have any rights. Uh, um, just to uh, continue with, uh, with the fact uh, that uh, people most of the times recently arrived people don't have uh, um, a network. Uh, uh, the Kamsko Healthcare Center uh, is one of the um, points of reference uh, to um, for uh, people without uh, healthcare insurance, uh, and that it really works uh, uh, via um, snowball, uh, you know, the snowball techniques of uh, via mouth uh, of words, uh, um, words of mouth. Sorry, and um, and uh, over there. Um, there is very much discussed uh, uh, the problem of, uh, for especially in the case of pregnancy, um, of how to um, balance access to health and the fact that uh, you are relying only on the, you don't have any social security system behind you that covers uh, all your um, all your needs, all your healthcare needs, and the fact that. Uh, um, you're relying only on the entries, on the salaries that you are perceiving as a person without, uh, um, without uh, a normal contract, uh, without uh, a white contract, if we want to call it that way. Um, and uh, to continue, this is the very uh, last part uh, of, of my presentation. I I also analyzed uh, this uh, this aspect uh, um, in an anthropological way. Um, this uh, picture is uh, very important to me because uh, it represents uh, uh, the way uh, Tikuna people understand uh, uh, their health in relation to the world. So the social and uh, personal and anthropological actually 
let's say to anthropological understanding of health of health and um, um, and the Tikuna are uh, um, um, a population living in the Aboriginal population living in the Colombian Amazon and um, I, over there I had uh, 21 days of ethnographic uh, experience let's say living with them and uh, thanks to these uh, I, I really understood somehow uh, our the cultural self uh, does not uh, uh, always reflect uh, the culture of uh, the the place you are living in. So in in non-Western countries, uh, pregnancy is uh, more a social than a biological event. Uh, um, whereas, as we said uh, at the very beginning of the presentation. In Western country, pregnancy is a biological event. Uh, so you're pregnant and um, there are a set of visits uh, that you have to do, the antenatal care. So it's, uh, it's very um, um, an event, uh, a condition that follows a biomedical model. But um, um, as I understood through, uh, thanks to this ethnographic ex experience uh, and to reading, thanks to the, the read of the literature, the repro reproduction itself uh, involves uh, both physical, so the, the, the physical self, and also behavioral change. And um, when associated with changes uh, that migration imposes, uh, um, it is important to consider also the results. Uh, going back to the study uh, of a Mexican migrant mother in the US, uh, it is described how um, migr Mexican migrant mothers uh, um, accessed somehow antenatal care, not regularly, not assiduously, as uh, the Western model wanted, but uh, um, to complement, let's say, to complement uh, uh, the, the uh, to fill the gaps of the Western models, they also referred uh, to their uh, cultural roots and they solved uh, uh, little problems also with a different approach than the biomedical model and. Um, um, another aspect that could be a, a great obstacle to access uh, um, antenatal care in these Western in these Western countries, in our Western countries, uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the person, the migrant, the regular migrant, doesn't have a familiarity uh, with the concept uh, of self in the receiving society. What are the do's and the do's and don'ts of uh, cultural do's and don'ts of uh, a pregnant woman in uh, in a Western country? So, uh, uh, to describe uh, this, uh, this phenomenon of, uh, of a reproduction and uh, anthropological self, uh, Smith Oka, in uh, one of her articles, uh, defined uh, the, this, uh, this uh, state of being the reproductive habitus. So, uh, the reproductive habitus, as we can read, are the modes of living the reproductive body, the bodily practice and the creation of new subjects through interaction between people and structures as men, as intended as institutions. And I asked myself, what are the, 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 these uh, interaction um, between uh, people and institutions uh, here in Geneva when it comes down to uh, reproduction? So. As described uh, in a later article published in 2018 by Fornioli, um, uh, people, irregular migrants, uh, have this uh, uh, have a problem in accessing reproductive uh, healthcare because they have fear, because they are blamed for their irregular access because they are stigmatized because uh, of the little uh, compliance with the Western rules because uh, they, uh, they 
they are blamed because they um, have a greater realization of an unplanned pregnancy that people want to uh, continue rather than uh, are, um, rather than uh, go to an IVG and uh, because they have uh, what is uh, called an inadequate access to antenatal care. But uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, um, I want to ask myself and yourself, uh, from which perspective can we say that access to antenatal care is inadequate? So uh, before going to the conclusions, uh, I would like to um, I would like to talk about uh, all the limitations of this uh, of this research as a real scholar. Um, so first of all, the data of uh, published by Wolf are kind of limited in sense in the sense that we don't have a lot of participants uh, and data anywhere were are quite old with respect to uh, some more recent uh, uh, literature. Uh, another uh, important uh, op uh, limitation is the fact that the migrant population is a very heterogeneous population and we can't really say um, that one thing fits all. That uh, so people might come from western countries people as me and people might come from other uh, countries which don't have this uh, western culture in uh, in medicine and then uh, another limitation that i wanted to 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 highlight is the fact that uh, yes in Western countries, I believe that most of the times pregnancy, physiological pregnancy, is somehow over medicalized. But uh, anyway, uh, standardized model of care, we have uh, seen it, are life saving and uh, work exceptionally well. Um, when biological equivalents in medicine are needed, let's think about uh, transplants and the COVID vaccine. What are the, the future directions? So, um, myself, I, I am looking for funds uh, uh, for, for doing uh, um, maybe another study, uh, taking into account uh, the different determinants of access to maternal care in a participative uh, uh, way and um, i would like uh, to 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 continue with this topic uh, and uh, merge qualitative and quantitative uh, clinical and personal and uh, uh, from different uh, perspective data to really continue re study the subject uh, and uh, and re somehow reply to this uh, to this question of mine but um, internationally <laughs> uh, we have seen uh, um, how there has been a cultural shift in, in medicine towards the personalized uh, medicine, and uh, which is taking steps. In 2018, the WHO uh, interpreter recommendations uh, suggested uh, to seriously take into account cultural as much as biomedical models of care. And, um, in this way, we have seen a, a, a sort of a transition, and um, in recent uh, in recent period as well, uh, the transition to telemedicine uh, is also very much taking uh, taking steps. Uh, and uh, I wonder if a mobile health tool uh, would uh, allow a better communication and a better access and a better understanding of, uh, of the process of access to antenatal care for irregular migrants. And very recently, the WHO um, published new guidelines uh, on virtual access to antenatal care. And I think that uh, there, are some, there is some room for, uh, for research uh, in, this, in this domain. So finally, uh, the first conclusion uh, we have to to gain it's our responsibility to, to gain a better understanding of uh, of this paradox uh, um, uh, and uh, why people don't access that assiduously antenatal care and what can we do to fill the gaps the cultural gaps 
of antenatal care. And um, by understanding uh, uh, and being open to understanding irregular migrant behavior towards reproductive and maternal services. Uh, and this is, I really much believe, uh, is uh, totally in line with the uh, 17 SDGs, but most uh, of all with, uh, with the third uh, SDG, uh, that is good health uh, and well-being. And finally, as a global health uh, uh, professional, I want to also highlight the importance of interdisciplinarity, of a different uh, multi-level point of view, uh, of uh, thinking of systems for, uh, for the analysis, of uh, human rights as, uh, and access to health as a human right, uh, and um, the fact that uh, solutions uh, must be sustainable and innovative and uh, adapted to, to people's needs. So um, before thanking you, uh, uh, well, I finished with my presentation, but before thanking you, I would like to get back to the, the quiz, the quiz results. Uh, well, we have just four responses. <laughs> I, I'm afraid that I did really actually uh, let you have uh, the time to reply to the question. So uh, I would like to go back to the QR code, uh, let you maybe reply to the questions uh, and in the meanwhile uh, let uh, Yuri pick some questions uh, and continue talking about this, uh, this very interesting topic with you. Thank you for now. Okay, thank you, Katarina. Katarina, thank you for your uh, eye-opening and inspiring lecture. So please, colleagues, can you fulfill the little quiz via the QR code? And if you have any questions, you can raise your hand or you can put a question in the chat box. It was a very great nuanced discussion, appreciated. Uh, Rona O'Connell, hi Rona, how are you? She mentions the Orama program. Maybe you can, you want to share something with us? So I I was really impressed by your presentation, Katarina. Um, I was also uh, reflecting um, when you had a slide about where do we locate irregular immigrants. Um, what do you think about or what is the, the challenge about their health literacy? Because I have the I think, but maybe I am wrong, I think that maybe health literacy of irregular immigrants is limited. And I mean by that, uh, uh, do, they have in, do they have enough insight in the structure of healthcare, like uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva? Uh, and also, do they have access to the internet? Because if you say, I want to consider the move, the transition to telemedicine, that's okay, but do they have the means? That's a reflection. So uh, thank you already for this question, Yuri. Uh, you're actually totally right. So there is not a lot of, uh, of uh, literature on the subject. Um, and uh, the very, the, the biggest reason is that uh, um, irregular migrants, uh, since they are somehow persecuted for their irregular status, um, don't want to, to, to appear. They, they most of, of the time remain in the shadow. And uh, this is also another reason why uh, network is, is so important to them. For, uh, for accessing antenatal care and care in general. So I've been uh, reading a lot about uh, um, what are the, 
the most important uh, obstacles uh, for for as well a healthcare worker to to provide access and provide uh, um, quality access, quality of care uh, to people that uh, lack of, uh, for example, documents. Uh, let's think about not only um, legal documents, but as well uh, uh, documents uh, of the pregnancy. Why not? And. Um, for example, uh, lack of uh, birth certificate uh, and um, how can we better even uh, um, allow uh, from, uh, from a legal point of view uh, access uh, for, for these people. So as, uh, when, I, when I was in Paraguay um, volunteering as, as a midwife, uh, I, I, I found, well, uh, I was uh, in the city of Encarnacion. I had this uh, very little experience that I wanted to, to report to you because it lasted just six months. <laughs> um, but um, at, by the end of, of the day, by the end of the experience, I, I, I realized uh, how, how midwives uh, are so central in the process of uh, uh, not only health rights, but human rights giving when uh, people don't manage to access regularly antenatal care and uh, why not also um, uh, pregnancy care and uh, um, childbirth care and uh, for example deliver alone um, in a, in their um, a deliver a room they don't have access uh, to a birth certificate they don't have access uh, to an identity for uh, to an, a recognized identity for their children and when it comes to um scholar scholarization period then your child doesn't have access uh, to school doesn't have access to education and uh, so there are um, a set of uh, of, uh, of processes uh, that start uh, right uh, from the moment uh, we 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 decide to take care and to um, to fight for this uh, uh, human right access to health for vulnerable people and uh, or not. So, uh, well, thank you for okay. your question. <laughs> thank you, Katarina. Uh, do you have some results? Because we only have two minutes to go. Do you have sorry? Do you have ah, the results? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So, uh, talking about the poll that I that I ask you to feel. So, most of the people, eighty five point seven percent, think about when thinking about irregular migrants, think about asylum seekers. But and it's very interesting this reply because uh, if we think about uh, asylum seekers, uh, they have uh, a very um, they have a very precise uh, 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 profile in all uh, um, in all countries, and uh, they are somehow more protected than irregular migrants. Asylum seekers uh, do have uh, are, are protected by the law, even here in Switzerland. They have access to care free of cost. They have access uh, to courses, to language courses, uh, to integrate uh, uh, culturally with uh, with the population. So this is. Uh, this is somehow it's not false but uh, it's very interesting this perspective because uh, actually as a matter of fact uh, uh, asylum seekers and also refugees uh, which were the two most selected uh, quest uh, answers uh, are the people most uh, uh, followed by by the authorities uh, and uh, they have uh, more access uh, to 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 health in general and then uh, for the open uh, question, what do you think is important studying, why do you think it's important studying migrants' access to maternal and uh, health in general? Um, so um, I think is um, it is vital, uh, I, I really like this, uh, this reply, I don't know whose uh, who surprise was that, but I wanted to read it to you. Uh, so has displaced people with fragmented health care and lack of uh, family support, is, it is vital that migrants can access maternal health without fear. And uh, this is, um, 
this is this is where I think uh, what uh, we can uh, really sum up to by the end of this presentation. So, as as healthcare professional, um, um, it is important. Uh, to, try to to let people understand uh, that uh, we are not uh, uh, we are not there at the hospitals uh, to take care about their legal status uh, or anything else but we are there to to care about them and to take care about them so really um, the most important message uh, um, that we have to 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 pass is that uh, we care for the other person just because it's a person and it doesn't matter their legal status or or anything else and then for the last question do you know how your country deals with ensuring ensuring access to health for irregular migrants so 75% uh, of, uh, of uh, people responding to the poll said yes, but still there is 25% uh, uh, that doesn't know. So I, I really invite you to uh, to resign uh, to to inform yourself because as a health, as a health professional, you have uh, not only the right but also um, the power uh, to allow people to access or not. Uh, help. So okay. um, I really want to thank you for your attention and this is my email address feel free to connect uh, and I look forward to uh, to continue discussing with you about this topic. Okay thank you so much Katarina. Thank I you Yuri.